Our reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll be reading the entire chapter. So again, uh, in deference to uh, those who need to sit, if you need to sit, go ahead. Actually, all of you sit because it's a long passage. We'll just do it that way. We'll be looking at part of chapter 2, but I'm only going to read chapter 1. So hear now the word of the Lord from 1 Samuel. There was a certain man of Ramathaim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zaph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah... He gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Now Connor, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Now Kana knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. 
For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. The word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and errant word. It is trustworthy and true in all that it speaks to because you are trustworthy. This word is God-breathed. It comes from your mouth through the inspiration of your spirit. So it has authority over us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and to understand the compassion and graciousness of your character, that you're a God who hears the prayers of your people, and you are eager to answer us according to your good, perfect, and pleasing will. Bless this time, Lord, and may you be our teacher this morning. For Christ's sake, amen. Everyone loves a good story, and as we've seen in our short study of the life of David, the Old Testament is filled with fascinating stories of unforgettable men and women. These stories do not simply relay information, they invite our participation. As we read them, we get caught up in the drama, identify with the characters, and hear the God of Israel speaking to us. Unlike Paul's letters, for instance, you think of Romans, Ephesians, Galatians. In the stories of the Old Testament, the theology is often revealed in the complex of human lives. And we are encouraged to enter into these experiences. The triumphs and the tribulations, the successes and the struggles assure that our sovereign God is able to work out his purposes through messy lives. Although God is not always mentioned at every point in the narrative, he is always present. As one noted, for the Hebrews, there was no such thing as secular history. Everything that happened, happened in a world penetrated by God. Now we come to the opening chapter of 1 Samuel against the dark period or a dark backdrop of a troublesome period in Israel's history, the period of the Judges. There were occasional bright spots along the way, but for the most part, in the book of Judges, we find the people and their leaders moving steadily away from the Lord. Israel needs godly leadership to restore order and to advance the cause of righteousness. So how does God plan to bring about this reformation among his people? By answering a prayer for a baby. If you're familiar with the books of Samuel, you know that they are dominated by three male characters, Samuel, Saul, and David. But in the opening chapter of 1 Samuel, it focuses on a woman. She's an average woman from a typical Jewish family, but she faces a personal crisis which compels her to cry out to God. And before you know it, Israel's history is moving in a different direction. Well, the first thing that I want us to consider this morning is Hannah's problem and our disappointments. Hannah's problem and our disappointments. The story begins with Elkanah and his family. He resides in the hill country of Ephraim, and according to Chronicles, he is a descendant of Levi, which of course would qualify Samuel to serve as priest. A few generations of his ancestry are noted. He has a proud past, but with Hannah, his line has no future. That's the reality that he must face. We're told that he had two wives, the name of the first wife, Hannah. Uh, that Her name appears first, suggesting that she was his original wife. But since she could not bear children, Elkanah apparently took on a second wife was able to provide him with sons and daughters. You may recall from Genesis that when Sarah was unable to conceive, she encouraged Abraham to sleep with her maidservant to produce an heir. And of course, he was also at fault for conceding. 
this idea of taking on another wife or sleeping with your spouse's maid servant and, or to secure offspring seems to have been a common practice in the ancient world. And although this might have been culturally acceptable, we realize it is not the biblical ideal. The biblical ideal established at creation and reaffirmed by the Lord Jesus himself is one man and one woman for life. As always, we must distinguish between what is described in the Bible and what is prescribed in the Bible. Not everything recorded is recommended to us. There are healthy as well as unhealthy examples. Now, even though God may have allowed polygamy in some cases, the Lord intentionally includes in Scripture all the problems associated with this practice. So when we read about the tension, the bitterness and jealousy between Sarah and Hagar, Leah and Rachel, and now Hannah and Penina, we get the impression this is an arrangement you want to avoid if you want to retain your sanity and have any peace in your home. Nevertheless, Elkanah's family is presented as relatively devout. And so in accordance with the law, he and his family regularly make their way to Shiloh, where the tabernacle of the Lord is located. This is not the formal temple yet, but the tabernacle. And they go there to worship and to sacrifice. And it's there that Eli's sons serve as priests. We hear more about them in the following chapters, and it's not a good report. The corruption and moral decay that characterizes Israel at this point in our history reaches all the way to the top, even finding a place among the priesthood. God plans to retire Eli and his sons permanently. That means to put them to death and to replace them with a true spiritual leader, a man by the name of Samuel. Of course, Hannah does not yet realize this. And the company of the sons and daughters of Penina, together with all the families of Israel, she is painfully reminded of her own barrenness. This is supposed to be a festive occasion. And you can imagine all the people sitting down after worship, eating and drinking together. The children are enjoying themselves, but Hannah is not in a cheerful mood. She's given a double portion of food, but this certainly doesn't alleviate the heartache that she feels. Yes, her husband loves her, but she cannot get over the excruciating truth, which continues to challenge her own identity as a woman. The Lord has closed her womb. We cannot even begin to imagine the stigma attached to barrenness at that time. It was often a, a painful and a shameful experience for a woman to endure. When the Bible says in verse 5, the Lord closed her womb, we must not think that this is an unscientific way of explaining infertility. It's possible that Hannah had some physical complication that prevented her from becoming pregnant, but it, even if she did, it would only be a secondary cause. The ultimate cause is attributed without apology to the Lord. He opens and closes the womb. He gives life and takes it away. It is his right. In verse 3 of this chapter, God is called the Lord of hosts. This is the first instance in scripture of this title being ascribed to the Lord. So these hosts represent the angels. The created realm and the armies of Israel. And as the Lord of hosts, God fights for his people and marshals all these forces to uphold his chosen nation. By identifying the Lord as, or God as the Lord of hosts, we understand that he is sovereign. And this truth has particular relevance for Hannah. God's sovereignty extends to all things, even to this woman's barrenness. But there's another side to this truth. Since God is sovereign, he is also able to change her condition. And he intends to do so. It's not just for Hannah's sake. It's because God is one who fights for his people. The nation lacks godly leadership and they are suffering for it. The Lord is not going to endure this any longer. It's time to introduce Samuel. 
The sadness and shame Hannah feels is heightened by the cruelty of her rival who keeps provoking her. We don't know exactly what she said, but uh, it was certainly very upsetting. One could imagine Panina saying something like this as they're all sitting around. Oh, it's so nice to enjoy, you know, just watching your children enjoy themselves. I guess you'll never experience that, Hannah. It's that sort of stinging remark that cuts to the heart. This went on year after year. Verse 7 says, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. As you know, words carry significant weight, and therefore we need to be careful how we use them. What you say and how you say it can either heal or harm, encourage or discourage. Panina uses her words to attack Hannah when she's down. She has no mercy. Alcon is like so many husbands. He's well-intentioned, but he says the wrong thing. In verse 8, he asks, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So ladies, let me ask you a question. When you're troubled or having a bad day, do you want your husbands to fix your problem, convince you that you don't have a problem, or do you just want them to listen and understand how you feel? Most of the time, you simply want your husband to listen with a sympathetic heart. To be attentive, affirming, and affectionate. And this is the part where the wives elbow their husbands and say, write that down. Um, attentive, affirming, and affectionate listening. Though Alcana appears to be affirming Hannah. He's basically asking for self-affirmation. Am I not more to you than ten sons? He misses the point entirely. No one seems to appreciate Hannah's depth of sorrow. There's only one. There's only one who truly understands. I think we can all identify with Hannah to some degree because we all face disappointments in life. Naturally, there's a certain amount of sorrow that we experience just from living in a fallen world, but there are other factors that contribute to our pain and hurt. A strained relationship with a family member or a spouse, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the debilitating effects of an illness. Things haven't turned out as we expected, and it's hard to come to terms with it. People have let us down. And we have let others down by not taking the right course of action. Some disappointments in life are self-inflicted as we suffer the consequences for our own uh, choices. But sometimes there are circumstances beyond our control that weigh us down. And perhaps some of you can identify with Hannah in a very direct way because as a couple, you're having trouble conceiving a child or perhaps... You cannot conceive a child. I'm sure you're happy when you uh, hear about other couples expecting, but sometimes it's hard. Agnes and I have one son for whom we are extremely grateful, and we're also grateful for his family. We needed medical assistance in order to conceive him. When he was about two years old, we tried again because we wanted more children. So we prayed fervently and made use of the means available to us. Over an extended period, we actually spent a good deal of time and money, but nothing happened. When we moved to Florida, we saw a specialist here in Orlando, and after some tests, he met with us in his office and said, Mr. and Mrs. Cavalli, I have the test results before me, and I'm sorry to inform you that it's no longer possible for you to have children. What? No longer possible? Doctor, are you sure? Yes, Mr. Cavalli, I'm sure. Well, that was very disappointing, especially when you consider all the ch children who are aborted and abused. It took us a while to deal with it. So why does God allow these heart-wrenching disappointments? There might be a number of reasons, but let me suggest two. 
The first is to cultivate your growth and satisfaction in Jesus. Our disappointments teach us that all is not well in the world. And as you think of the ongoing crises in our world, they all serve to heighten what we already know to be true, namely that everything in this life is subject to change and corruption, and nothing in this temporal existence offers the sustained security or contentment we long for. Our disappointments, whether they be personal or relational, bring this truth into sharp relief. The book of Proverbs, as you know, offers inspired principles of wisdom, which, if followed, will protect you from foolish choices that will bring harm to you and your loved ones. But do those principles protect you from every sorrow? And the answer is no. And yet there are many today who see Christianity as some sort of method among others, to help them overcome all their problems and to protect them from pain. Well, God has a different agenda. Comfort is not the primary goal. It's conformity. Conformity to the image of his son. It's about growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and becoming more like him. The Lord does not remove all of our struggles, but rather uses them to nurture our intimacy with him, preparing us for future glory. There's a great line from Samuel Rutherford's letters. Rutherford was one of the Scottish commissioners to the Westminster Assembly. And prior to that, he was in prison for preaching the gospel, but corresponded with his parishioners through letters, which thankfully were preserved to benefit countless others, And this is what he wrote to a dear woman who suffered a tragic loss. This is what he suggested the Lord might be up to in her despair. He wrote, in all your trials, the Lord is loosening you at the root from perishing things and hunting after you to grip your soul. How often do we vainly see consolation and fulfillment in temporal things? They may be good things, but they're not the greatest good. Thank God that he works to loosen us from the attachments of this world so that our hearts might be captivated, indeed intoxicated, with the surpassing beauty of the Lord Jesus, who is the perpetual spring of all goodness. You must learn that Jesus is the source of everything you need in order to become whole in the image of God. And you and I cannot learn that fundamental lesson when we are disillusioned by the transitory pleasures of this world. We may not like it, but God is in the business of crushing our self-sufficiency and the false idols that we cling to to secure our happiness. You say, why does he do that? To make us miserable? No. It's because your father loves you. And he wants you to experience the boundless treasures that are found in Christ. Only as you find your fullness in him can you say along with the psalmist, earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The second reason God allows you to feel disappointment in life is to make you more sensitive to people who are discouraged. They may be individuals in your family, among your friends, among your church family. It's not perfect people immune to disappointment who are best suited to offer encouragement to the downtrodden, but those who are familiar with suffering. As Christians, we believe that our God is big enough to redeem even our deepest sorrows and make those experiences useful for his kingdom. You all know this from 2 Corinthians. We comfort others with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So our appointments or disappointments are appointed by God that we might enter into richer dimensions of faith and service. Having reflected on Hannah's problem and our disappointments, we move on now to Hannah's prayer and our dependence. Hannah's prayer and our dependence. Verse 9 reflects a change in the scene and action 
It says, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. She rises to take action. After years of ridicule from her uh, rival, Panina, and a lack of understanding from her husband, Hannah can bear it no longer. She feels that she must do something. But what? All she can do is plead with her God. The Lord allows Hannah to come to the end of herself to move her to prayer. Now she's in Shiloh where the presence of God dwells among his people. This is her opportunity, her chance to speak with God as it were face to face. We get the impression that her sorrow will crush her if she doesn't bring herself before the Lord. This is a bold move on Hannah's part. She goes to the sanctuary without her husband. Eli the priest is there watching from the entrance. It's clear that she's not there to talk to him but to God. And in the Lord's presence the dam breaks and the tears pour forth. She cannot contain herself, but it's all right because Hannah needs to cry. She's been carrying around this private pain for a long time. Verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Though they flow from anguish, these are good tears. There is such a thing as good tears, tears that lead to healing. It's been said that the soul would have no rainbow had the eyes no tears. And men, lest you think that this is just an uncontrollable outburst of an emotional woman, I would remind you of the Bible's description of the Lord Jesus himself. The writer of Hebrews tells us he offered up, pra- uh, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him and from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. True intimacy with the Lord presupposes authenticity. If you cannot be honest and open with God, it's doubtful you'll be real with anyone. So Hannah casts her prayer in the form of a vow and offers a petition and a promise simultaneously. She asks the Lord to look upon her misery to remember her, to grant her a son, and in turn she promises to give this child back to the Lord all the days of his life and vows that no razor will ever touch his head. This is reminiscent of the Nazarite vow in number six. You think of Samson as a sign of consecration to the Lord. A Nazarite was to keep his hair uncut and abstain from alcohol. Hannah now undertakes this vow on behalf of her son and sets him apart for a life of obedience. The Bible says, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman and Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. Personally, I think this is a sad commentary on Eli. Here he is, the spiritual leader of Israel, and he doesn't uh, recognize piety when he sees it. Apparently, Eli is not familiar with heartfelt prayer. Eli may be able to perform his outward duties, but where's the man's heart? John Bunyan, the great Puritan, wrote, In prayer, it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. And Hannah represents the more excellent way. Of course, Hannah's not drunk. She's desperate. And she assures Eli that she hasn't been drinking. As a grief-stricken woman, she's simply pouring out her soul to the Lord. And convinced of this, Eli pronounces a blessing upon her. He says, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Hannah takes Eli at his word and replies, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her her face was no longer sad. In spite of all his faults, Eli is still the Lord's anointed. And Hannah recognizes that when he speaks, he speaks with authority. She receives his benediction as if it's from God. And as a result, her disposition is transformed. 
She comes to God in despair, but she leaves God's presence with peace and assurance. Like Hannah, our disappointments are meant to drive us to God in prayer. In the midst of your trials and troubles, the Lord does not want you to rely on your own resources. Indeed, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Looking to the Father through the Son magnifies his power and compassion, and that attitude of dependence is expressed most plainly in prayer. Prayer is the natural breath of faith. In faith, we look away from ourselves to Jesus to overcome sin and persevere in suffering. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some here this morning dealing with a heavy heart, even on a day like today. Some are joyful, celebrating Mother's Day with family, while others are reminded of loss or broken family history that has left some scars. And then there are other factors that can make life feel a bit overwhelming, whether they be personal, relational, vocational. Do you know what it's like to feel overwhelmed or to feel heartbroken, alone, or misunderstood like Hannah? It's precisely in those times that the Lord invites you to cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Either you can turn inward to your own detriment or you can lay your burdens before the Lord and allow him to restore what's fragmented and broken. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Does that reflect the way you approach God in prayer? Do you pour out your heart or do you just pray in general for this and that? Oh, Lord, bless this one, that bless one, that one. The language of the psalmist conveys honesty, humility, intensity. It's impossible to handle the ongoing disappointments of life effectively unless you're in the habit of pouring out your heart to God. The soul will not find relief any other way. It wasn't meant to. In this story, Hannah leaves Eli with a whole new disposition, even though her circumstances have not yet changed. She's still barren. So how do we account for this dramatic turnaround? Hannah believes the word spoken to her. Yes, it comes from the lips of Eli, but she finds its origin in God. This word offers hope and lifts her spirit. It proves beneficial to her because she is a woman of faith. How do you respond to the word spoken to you? The word read, the word listened to, in faith or indifference? I know that already. How do you respond to the promises of God? Peter calls them very great and precious promises. Now, I cannot promise you that God is going to grant you children or remove a chronic illness or restore a broken relationship. But I can say this. If you believe the word, if you believe what God says about his commitment to you, if you believe what he says about his undying love for you in Christ, his sovereignty over your life, and his promise to keep you and enable you to endure, you will rise from prayer strengthened and encouraged. God might not change your circumstances. God might not change the difficult people around you. But he can always change you. He can always change you and enable you to perceive and handle things differently. Indeed, supernaturally. So we looked at Hannah's problem and our disappointments, Hannah's prayer and our dependence, and lastly, Hannah's praise and our deliverance. In verses 19 and 20, we're told how God answered Hannah's prayer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Well, this is exactly what Hannah had asked for, that the Lord would remember and not forget. When you see that phrase in Scripture, God remembered, it reflects his intention to act. 
and bring about his purpose. And the Bible says, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore him a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. In Hebrew, asked of God or heard of God uh, sounds like the name Samuel. And his conception and birth following Hannah's plea is no mere coincidence. She recognizes that the God of Israel has answered her petition. The Lord remembers Hannah, and Hannah also remembers. She has not forgotten her vow. When she came before the Lord, she did not make a hasty promise just to get her way. You know how people do that. Oh, Lord, if you just answer this prayer, I promise to do this or that. And then when God does, they forget uh, their, their own pledge. Hannah has every intention of honoring her pledge. As the story unfolds, she does not bring Samuel to Eli right away. The priests are not prepared to care for an infant. Hannah stays home with Samuel until he is weaned. And no doubt those years were uh, special times for Hannah and her son. I'm sure she cherished every moment because she knew that the day was drawing near when she would have to say goodbye to her little boy. Sooner or later, every parent must let go. But in Hannah's case, it came quite early. She seems to have been prepared for that moment because she understood that her child ultimately belonged to the Lord, something every parent has to remember. After Samuel was weaned, his mother took him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. In verse 26, she tells Eli, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord granted me my petition that I made to him, so now I give him to the Lord. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. This story began with a barren woman full of lament, but it ends with a grateful mother full of praise. In chapter 2, we find Hannah's prayer, which is more like a song. And if you look at Mary's song in the New Testament, there's a lot of similarities. I'm not going to read that chapter, just highlight a few verses. Now, you would think that in turning Samuel over to Eli, that Hannah would be terribly despondent. But listen to her words at the beginning of chapter 2. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies, for I rejoice in your salvation or your deliverance. Then in verse 5, the barren woman has borne seven. That represents the ideal number. But she who has many children is forlorn. In this song, Hannah testifies that a person's status in life is not to be regarded as fixed or unchangeable. The Lord is able to reverse it. To pray for change is not to fight against providence. A firm belief in God's sovereignty is good news for those in dire circumstances who look to the Lord and trust him for new beginnings. And in this song, Hannah does not focus on the gift, but on the giver. She says, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings low and he exalts. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. The underlying message of Hannah's story and song is a constant theme throughout Scripture. The Lord's strength is perfected in our weakness. As we depend upon God in our disappointments, he brings about our deliverance in his time. And one of the lessons that you need to learn this morning is that the Lord is willing to intervene. Where do you need the Lord's intervention right now? Are you waiting on God? Or have you given up hope? Have you resigned yourself to the thought, well, this is just the way it's going to be? Perhaps. But sometimes I think we're too quick to draw that conclusion when the Lord is actually seeking to spur us on in prayer. God may choose to deliver you from your unpleasant circumstances or he may deliver you from unmet desires by granting you a sufficient degree of 
peace in the situation. Either way, he's willing to extend himself to you. Sometimes he allows you to feel desperate, which makes his deliverance all the more amazing. It's been pointed out that Samuel is not simply God's gift to Hannah. He's God's gift to the nation. Like Hannah, Israel is barren. Each has a need only God can satisfy. Likewise, on our own, we are barren. We have no power whatsoever to generate the new life that we desperately need as sinners. In fact, we're so corrupt, we don't even desire God on our own. We're content to go our own way. But the Lord is merciful. And he takes pleasure in delivering his creation from sin and death. This deliverance comes through the person and work of Christ. Through his life, death, resurrection, Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He gives us new hearts to love him, faith to trust him, and peace with God as we rest in him. We are a people born of God who possess every spiritual blessing in Christ, as you learned from your Sunday school lesson in Ephesians. Does that make you immune to troubles in this life? No. But your future liberation from all the brokenness you see around you and find within you is coming. It is coming. Jesus is going to turn this world on its head and restore what has been ravaged by sin. And Hannah's song foreshadows the great reversal Jesus came to bring about for God's people through his death and resurrection. It is through the weakness of the cross that God displays his saving power. Isn't it ironic that Jesus triumphs over death through death? He, he came to reverse the curse, to make everything new. That we might dwell with him on a new heaven and a new earth. Perfectly suited for a holy God and a holy people. That is the Christian hope. And what that hope tells me is that your trials are not in vain. God can use your disappointments to enhance your relationship with him. And your service to others. And in the midst of all your struggles Jesus wants you to trust him for continued growth and new beginnings because this is the way he operates. He shows off his power through your weakness. In her song, Hannah declares, it is not by might that men prevail. You are God's testimony to neighbors and nations that it's not the mighty who overcome, it's the weak and needy who acknowledge they're weak and needy and trust in a Savior able to make something beautiful out of their shattered and messy lives. That's good news. It's a message of hope in desperate times, and God would have you to become people of hope in and for the world. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do praise you for your compassion. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. We are people vulnerable to disappointment and discouragement. Please remind us that you're able to meet the deepest needs of our souls, and indeed our greatest need is to be more like your son. Draw close to us as we pray and make us sensitive to others who are particularly struggling right now. By your spirit, may we be patient in affliction, passionate in prayer, and persistent in our pursuit of Christ. In his name we pray, amen.